I'm here with Daniel Perel and Sarek Tokbalat, both representatives of the Baha'i International Community. Uh, in a few days, the 53rd session of the United Nations Commission for Social Development will begin. And the theme for this year's commission is rethinking and strengthening social development in the contemporary world. Uh, we know many NGOs will be attending this commission, and the Baha'i International Community among them is putting forward a number of ideas to contribute its thinking and its experience um, to this very important topic. So I'm speaking with uh, Daniel and Sarek today to try to learn more about what those ideas are. So Dan, do you want to say a few words? Uh, I think broadly, just to, to start the conversation, um, you see in the reports that are coming out of the UN a heavy emphasis on financial and technological transfer you know, from those countries who have to those countries who don't have, from those people who have to those people who don't have. And I think a large element of our contribution uh, at this time is just to add to the mix that it's not about what you have in terms of material possessions that defines how you can contribute to the social development of your community or of your nation. It's about the volition that you take in, in you know, putting forth actions for the betterment of your community. And that like financial and technological transfers, those sorts of ideas should be articulated a bit more clearly uh, in the reports that come from the UN. It's not to say that we know how to articulate them, but that a, a conversation should be had around the role of human capacity, as well as financial and technological, in contributing to the social advancement of a, of a mm -hmm. community. Sarah? Yeah, I think if we look back um, to the history, we know that in, during past over the course of past uh, 15 years, the, the international community was focusing on Millennium Development Goals in order to achieve the set targets at the beginning of the um, millennium and um, trying to eradicate those poverty and uh, malnutrition, educational problems, health issues, all sorts of uh, social problems that we had. Mm -hmm. And now we're at the stage when, um, the, as the international community, as one um, uh, united, uh, so to say, a group are trying to develop a new set of targets and a new set of uh, goals for the next 15 years. And we know that as, as a result of international uh, open working group um, at the UN level, we came up with uh, 17 uh, sustainable development goals and uh, about 170 targets that we need to achieve in order to eradicate all those problems and solve the problems. Mm -hmm. But you know, when we say social development and we talk in terms of general terms, we realize that we don't meet um, our targets because there are still a lot of poor, many poor people, there are still issues with uh, health, still issues with education, and really this uh, commission theme is very timely because we really need to reconsider the social development uh, as we understand it because according to my understanding in the past, they were uh, basically, and, and currently as well, they were basically considering um, finances and technology as the main means of um, achieving the set targets. So if we analyze the past reports from the Secretary General, um, the, the synthesis report, for example, he made, he says that, no, besides the uh, finances and technology, we have uh, human agency. Mm -hmm. And he's basically saying that, uh, we cannot uh, solve the issues of humanity without uh, people embracing the agenda we're setting today. And, um, but of course, we also notice that uh, the, the biggest proportion of interest or time is spent for finances and technology mm. because we don't really understand how to incorporate human, human um, agenda into, social, in, into this rethinking process. And uh, I just wanted to mention that fact that uh, after our analysis, we just realized that uh, more than 30 paragraphs were focusing on technology. Uh, in finances the synthesis In the report, synthesis report yeah. was focusing on uh, finances. Um, about a dozen of them were focusing on technology, whereas only four uh, was uh, looking at um, institutional capacity and one each for volunteerism and, uh, culture. and culture. Yeah. Which is, I think, not fair because those people who, who live uh, in poverty in particular, they're, they, they comprise uh, like half of the population of the world. And if you look at the, uh, the indicator, we have um, 3.8 billion people live um, just under uh, $4 a day. Of mm -hmm. course, the 
the financial indicator is not uh, is not perfect and there's a lot of um, arguments about that but still it we cannot uh, the UN does not ignore anymore that fact that um, that should not be uh, the only indicator but nevertheless mm -hmm. such a big number of uh, people are suffering still and I think know. too um, you know you raised the question about um, the, the fact that this is a very timely theme and that we're thinking about social development and at the heart of social development are people. And of course, we, we acknowledge that a financial, a technological, and all kinds of material resources are absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, there are many areas of underdevelopment in the world that, that, that need to become more developed uh, materially and in every way. But I think when we talk about people and the question of their agency comes up, then that leads us to the question of capacity building. How can their agency uh, be strengthened? How can they come to play their rightful role in um, contributing to the advancement of their own family and of their communities? And so how does the Baha'i interna international community understand um, that kind of capacity? What is it? How is it built? How does it grow? Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Um, you know, um, again, looking back at statistics and reports, we can we realize that um, just a small number of uh, people in the world have, like, the biggest proportion of the wealth. And if I'm not mistaken, 20% of the planet gets 80% of the benefits and wealth. And uh, that actually means that very small group of people have, have the, the money and, uh, like, uh, financial and technological capacity to solve the issues. But... In fact, if you take an example of a, a business person, uh, it's not the f it's not the case that uh, I mean it's not always that that person would necess necessarily go and uh, try to use all his resources to solve the social problems he can uh, he have around him. And at the same time, if you look at the village or grassroot I mean grassroot level, level the, uh, an individual there um, uh, might um, take actions that can cause a great impact on his community. So, the, 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 as Dan mentioned today, there is the aspect of volition. So, uh, the person should be inspired and, and um, um, try to uh, do his best in order to uh, make his contribution. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. There's, there's capacity building, but it, it's not just capacity building for those who don't have the material means. Mm -hmm. There's also capacities that we have to build in those who have material wealth. The capacity for generosity, for uh, reading the, the social tensions in their communities, and the capacity to act on those. So whereas a lot of the, the development discourse focuses on those who are materially poor receiving capacity development from those who are materially rich, we may be missing a key point which is actually building the capacity of those who have wealth to inspire them to take action to better their, their communities. I mean, ultimately, what is, what is money for? The purpose of life is not to get money, to have a bigger bank account. It's to, to have joy and love and happiness. And this is something that everybody can experience regardless of financial means. And so as long as we continue to focus on those who have giving to those who don't, uh, I think we're, we're missing the boat on what truly can inspire people to take action. And of course, it's not to say that expertise in a certain area is irrelevant to the projects that are being undertaken locally. That is, a lot of what I'm saying uh, requires uh, that communities figure out what is, what is best for them uh, in order to pursue their development projects. It's not to say that the, that the wealthier countries and individuals should stay out of the processes, but it's to say that there's a, there has to be an increased understanding of mutualism mm -hmm. and, and where action should derive from. Um, if we continue to see the world as the 20% having to develop the rest, then I, I think we're in for a, a rude awakening because those 20% uh, don't understand the lives of the rest. It has to come from the rest. And of course, I'm using terms loosely here. But it has to come from those who are not written about in newspapers and not talked about in, in magazines to take action in their communities. And then for the those who have resources to support in those actions in ways that are complementary, 
not in ways that are sort of reinforcing systems that have led to inequalities, yeah. but in, in new ways that can, can lead to uh, mutualism. And I think what I hear you talking about is a certain lens through which we see the world, um, is that we understand that, of course, there are um, huge material disparities. But if our financial material lens is not the main lens through which we see the world, then we can see 7 billion people um, with different access to opportunities that allow them to make their mark in the world. And um, and if we can imagine a world where everybody is contributing, I think we it's it's hard to even imagine how different that world would be because of the number of of of, of ideas, of voices, and of the kinds of um, goodwill and talents that would be um, that would be released. And I think you're speaking to a, a model of development that sees those um, amazing riches that exist in the world, but are not able to be expressed. I wanted to ask you a question too, um, also related to capacity building, to collective, to, to working together. And again, that's something that is missed when we speak about only individuals or only institutions. What What is that particular capacity? Why is it so important when we're rethinking social development? I don't know, Dan, if you want to speak it, first. Sure. Um, as you mentioned, a lot of the literature focuses on individuals. Uh, and it focuses on institutions. Uh, if you look at some of the, the mechanisms that the, that the United Nations has established, there are places where countries as institutions can monitor each other and where people can, it, you know, bring out those elements uh, of state responsibility that maybe are not being met. Um, and this sets up a binary where you have, you're either a member of an institution or you're an individual. Uh, or a group of individuals, perhaps. But what's missing is the community dimension, that we all go home to families. You know, I may live in the same neighborhood as a, as a banker and as somebody who is living in poverty. But we are a community, and that community needs to learn how to take action as, as a collective, as you say, as well. Uh, and that's an element of human history that we used to, I would, I would say, focus on much more. You know, the, the village where uh, international trade is not the, the main means of financial uh, betterment, but one where you have your shoemaker, your farmer, your teacher, and they all live in a mutualistic society. And in fact, in, in vast portions of the world today, it's still that way. Uh, you have uh, communities where when somebody builds a house, everybody comes together to help them build a house. Uh, when you need to educate children, it takes a village. Um, and, you know, when there's a wedding, the whole community is invited. And so that community tie is very strong. And yet in the, what we call the developed world, that seems to be missing. And I'm not arguing or I'm not putting forth that we should return to that community-based living where we don't have any more trade. It's a matter of learning how to translate the reality that we are social beings into the the communities, the cities, the, the societies that we have developed today. I don't have answers, but it's more about finding the right questions to ask so we can conduct research. And that's what this whole uh, commission is about, rethinking social development. And it's an opportunity for us to, to reflect and, and rethink uh, these elements. And, and so I think your question about uh, the community, the individual, the institution is, is really vital at this time. Derek, do you want to add something? Yes, uh, I wanted uh, to look at it uh, from the perspective of um, forecasting for the future. Mm -hmm. So I, I came across with uh, an interesting book uh, called Eleven, which says that um, in in two hundred two thousand and year of two thousand one hundred, we will have about eleven billion people. And if you look back, you realize that there were just several generations necessary to. Uh, become uh, six, 7 billion from 1 billion, mm -hmm. which happened very quickly just in mm -hmm. 100 years. Mm -hmm. So basically in another 100 years we're going to have twice, almost twice more people. And if we don't uh, rethink mm -hmm. the issues of social development now, we might have even bigger problems in the future. So I think this is a, a proper time for um, reconsidering because now is the first time maybe when at the global level institutions, countries and, and uh, um, individuals are coming together and consulting and making plans together. This is a big achievement and I think we, we should build on that mm -hmm. and uh, 
come up with the more advanced and all-inclusive uh, agenda. Mm -hmm. So I think with the commission starting in two days, there are obviously many issues and challenges to be discussed. But also, as you said, Sarek, I think it's worth um, noting the Herculean effort, really, that it took uh, for the world community to take the steps that it did uh, to come up with the sustainable development goals. Of course, they are not perfect, but they do represent um, really an impressive advancement in mm -hmm. terms of how we think about who is involved in articulating the goals and how many people were involved. And perhaps we can be hopeful that in the future, that level of, uh, of participation and of thoughtfulness of voice and, uh, and people will also continue to grow and evolve. So thank you both very much. Thank you.